there was a scene where he gets shot and like taking his dying breaths and he's asking Eleven to say that she understood, you know, why he did what he did or whatever, that he never meant bad. He like wanted good things for her, um, but she needs to understand. And it was like the scene where I expected Eleven to like just say, yeah, I understand or whatever, you know, before he dies. But she showed like this dope ruthlessness in not giving him the satisfaction and just saying goodbye, Papa. What up, what up, folks? What's going on? Welcome to the Spun Today podcast, the only podcast that is anchored in writing, but unlimited in scope. I'm your host, Tony Ortiz, and I appreciate you listening. This is episode 213 of the Spun Today podcast. And in this episode, I speak about watching Andrew Schultz's infamous comedy special. I also speak about watching Stranger Things season four and Billions season six. And I also add an addition to our goats doing goat shit segment this one is a goodie so do stick around folks but before we get into the episode i want to tell you guys about a cool new way that you can help support the spun today podcast if you so choose while simultaneously creating your own show then after that we'll get right into the episode do you want to start your own podcast have a great show idea that you want to get out into the masses but don't know quite how to get it from your head out into the world? Well, here's how. Use the podcast host, Libsyn. That's who I use to bring the Spun Today podcast to you. And now you can use them the same way. Using the promo code SPUN, S-P-U-N, you can open up your Libsyn account today and get two months of free podcast hosting. Here's how it works. Once you record your show, you upload it to your Libsyn account, where you can fill in your episode notes, upload your podcast art, and schedule when you want your episodes to release. Once you do that, Libsyn will take care of the rest. They'll distribute your show to Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and all the other podcatchers that you choose instantaneously and seamlessly. Again, go to Libsyn.com and use the promo code SPUN, S-P-U-N, to get two months free. Or use the affiliate link that's in the episode notes. Again, that's Lipson.com, promo code SPUN. Take that great podcast idea from out of your head and put it out into the world. The Andrew Schultz infamous comedy special is not available on any streamer. And I will circle back to that because it bleeds into our goats doing goat shit segment. Andrew Schultz, for those of you who don't know, is a New York comic stand-up comedian and podcaster, host of the Flagrant Podcast with Akash Singh, as well as Brilliant Idiots, the podcast with Charlemagne the God. I've spoken about him before on the podcast, specifically in reference to the Schultz Saves America uh, Netflix special, which was like a four-part little mini-series that he did. They got picked up by Netflix based on these like really dense, funny, and by dense, I mean like dense with like information and comedy pieces that he used to do on Instagram. He and his team, Mark Agnon, Alex Media, etc. And they became so popular that Netflix picked it up and he wound up doing a version for them. He's also a comic that has shifted the mold in stand-up comedy and was the first to begin dropping his specials exclusively on YouTube and using YouTube and Instagram and social media in this format of like creating clips and putting it out there for free to promote your stand-up comedy date shows and your podcasts, etc. And a lot of comics have since, you know, paid homage and followed suit and have found, you know, great success in doing so. And not just like up and coming comics like Fahim Anwar or like Dan Soder or the Brendan Chobbs of the world who have uh, tried this model, but also some OG comics like Brian Callen, for example, and others. But anyway, this special we were really anticipating, and by we I mean the quote-unquote asshole army, as he calls his uh, podcast supporters, because although he has put out specials in the past, again, via YouTube for free, this was one that he announced was being purchased by a streamer. Everybody, well, I don't know if everybody, but I assume 
that would be Netflix since he already had that previous deal with Netflix with that uh, four part series. And we're just like looking forward to him like doing it big and cashing in that in that way. But again, more on that a little bit later. I'll circle back to that. Let me tell you guys a bit about the special and some of my favorite parts. It was so good, really funny, and exactly what you expect from an Andrew Schultz special, which is, as he says it, everybody can get it. Like part of everybody letting their guard down when it comes to like his comedy specials and like certain other comics, like um, Joe Coy does this a lot as well, like fucking with the crowd and stuff like that. But part of his thing, if you will, is that every ethnicity, every nothing's off the table, like every stereotype every ethnicity every any like disability any everybody can get it everybody can get the jokes he's his take is if you come to a comedy show you don't want to be you know treated differently you know if you have a handicap or something like that you want to be made fun of and you should be treated as equal as everybody else just like the white guy in the front row or the black dude in the front row the hispanic guy in the front row etc and it does have that disarming quality for like the entire audience that's like at ease especially in this like pc culture type of environment that we live in and it's kind of like a, a breath of fresh air in that way so you definitely get a lot of that um the show starts off big super big from the beginning and one of the dopest openings that i've ever seen because everything goes dark then there's a spotlight on the balcony in this theater um he filmed it in a in a theater in austin and bruce buffer the announcer for the ufc announces him like the same way that he announces ufc title fights he's like and now the undisputed heavyweight you know like that whole whole jazz and like completely serious and like the exact same way he would be doing for a title fight which is dope it's sick i've definitely never seen that before and especially with um like schultz fans there's like a there's like an overlap with like schultz and like rogan fans and obviously you know rogan with his ties with the ufc and like mma community kevin bruce buffer there was like such a dope touch then it pans to the stage and you walks out with his hands behind his back just like walking towards the stage like you know taking it in looking looking at the theater then raises his hands up and then like smoke like a little smoke show kind of thing like comes up like from the stage from like all different sides like shoots up while the music is playing in the background which i believe was a rust song if I'm not mistaken, I know he, the outro was a Russ song, which is dope, you know, supporting like independent artists or at least, you know, artists that grind independently to a certain extent. Um, I don't remember if the intro song was also a Russ song, but that said, then the music goes away and he jumps right into crowd work right away. So he took that like big, huge opening moment and then just like brought you back into like that comfortable Schultz fucking with the crowd type of vibe. Then um, he sees a, the, this Latin couple in the front row, and he's like, he's like, oh, uh, Latina? And she's like, yeah. And then he asks if she's on birth control. <laughs> and then um, start laughing, and then he's like, you can't fuck around with the pullout method with them, yo. Fucking come come on a Latina stomach, and that shit just opens up and grabs that shit and pulls it in like hungry, hungry hippos. <laughs> it was like, you got you to flip them around and come on the back. That, and that's why they call him wetbacks. And then he just walks away. He's like, everybody can get it. <laughs> and then, then um, what else did I like from it? He goes, uh, he has like this bit. He he put this out for free as well, um, because he 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 took a, bu- a bunch of like chunks from the show, and like some bits, some some individual chunks, and put it free on Instagram and and YouTube to promote the show, obviously. And there's this one bit that's on Instagram um, where he talks about missing Trump. Then, like, some girl screams, like, woo! And he's like, wait, hold up. I mean, I mean, like, for the entertainment value, not for its, like, policies and shit. And then he's like, wait, was that you, Indian girl? There was, like, an Indian chick in the crowd. And he's like, you definitely put the non in QAnon. Holy shit. <laughs> Which is just hilarious. Like, clutch off the dome. If it was off the dome, you know, because who knows. But, you know, the whole, like, non bread, which is big in Indian culture, obviously, and, you know, QAnon, get it? Yeah, my delivery sucks, but <laughs> anyway, what else did I like? Um, he talks about the the MAGA hat, and he's like, that Trump hat was like white people's teardrop tattoo. <laughs> he was like, motherfuckers wearing that, they just didn't give a fuck. They were like, it's literally the last thing you put on before you leave the house. It's like, if you put that on, you're like, I want to have a rough day today. 
another bit that had me rolling was um he was speaking about white woman rage and then he's like doing this little like mocking tone and he's like you're offended and i'm bored let's go do something about it like in a white girl voice and he's like there's a problem that has nothing to do with me let's go solve it <laughs> and he's like um i need to stand up for my black friends that i don't have it's fucking hilarious then um he's fucking with the black couple in the front row and he's like you know blackface is not acceptable you know it's not a good thing right am i right and then he's like except in like those navy seal commercials then it's like hey look it's blackface in a helicopter hey look it's blackface in the water whoa they can swim <laughs> oh this is hilarious he goes um there's this uh a biracial couple a black lady and a white dude and the white dude has like long hair and he's telling the guy he was like yo that's a fucking beautiful head of hair that you have he was like is that yours or do you guys buy wigs together <laughs> oh man and you know and he's doing this uh you know crowd work and like fucking with the crowd like in between bits and shit like that which is dope and there was this bit that i that i liked he was like he was like yo america is we're like the most liberal progressive people when gas is like at a dollar fifty when things are like that, we're like, you know, respect all cultures all around the world, etc. He was like, once gas starts hitting five dollars, we're like, yo, they look like they need some democracy over there in the Middle East, Biden. What you gonna do about it? <laughs> and then this last one that I'll share with you guys, um, he's talking about uh, sexism. He was like, listen, ladies here in America, you got to deal with sexism and shit like that. But this is the best place that you have it. It's not like you're going to move somewhere else. He's like, yeah, we're sexist here. You know, you know, women here have to deal with comparing themselves to these unrealistic images every day on social media and try to let, like live up to these ideals. But in China, they can't even have women. You know, if they give birth to a girl, they can't even have girls. <laughs> so you have it way better here. And then he's like, you, you know, yeah, we make fun of you here that oh, women can't drive. Uh, but in the Middle East, it's like, no, women can't drive <laughs> like what she's trying to get behind the wheel let, let me let's stone the bitch it was just fucking hilarious great special and now let me tie it out sir circle back to what i was touching on in the beginning and bleed into our goats doing goat shit segment which for those of you who listen to the podcast it's a segment where i like to highlight goats within their respective areas who do goat shit you know who aren't afraid to say you know fuck you to the system and not just play politics they do goat shit and kind of like own that goatness if you will it's like having fuck you money but not saying fuck you it's like what's the point if you have fuck you money say fuck you anyway so going back to the, what i was saying in the beginning of you know schultz selling his special to a streamer and he was you know about to announce it but there was some like back and forth apparently we found out you know through the pod that he did did sell the show to a streamer which i'm speculating was netflix and it came back with notes apparently you know schultz coming from this background of creating that movement of you know putting your shit out on youtube and doing it the way you want to do it and owning your own shit it's you know he wasn't used to like getting notes back and not a lot of comic not all comics get notes back like the bigger ones streamers and and platforms where they sell the material to you know, they're so big that they're like, do whatever the fuck you want. Here's the money. Thank you for letting us, you know, distribute your shit. But other comics don't have that luxury. And I guess uh, Schultz got some notes back and, you know, he didn't want to change things. He didn't want to, you know, first time he sells to a streamer, start watering it down and cutting out bids because they're worrying about appeasing some corporate marketers and, you know, doing what they have to do for their business on their end. So... What Schultz did is he bought his special back in an unprecedented, risky fucking move. After his special was sold, he bought it back so he can retain the complete ownership of it and so that he can put it out himself, a la like Louis C.K. style, you know, through his own website. And that's what he decided to do. He put all his money into purchasing it back. So this way he wouldn't have to cut anything. He can give it to his fans the way they're used to seeing his comedy in terms of, you know, not self-editing and, and worrying about like corporate interests and shit like that. 
and bet on his fans, aka the asshole army, to you know ride with him and want to see the special. And this is where the goats doing goat shit piece kicks in. Like the like he shared on the on the podcast, you know, it was like nerve wracking time because he was like, you know, if this doesn't work, I just lost a shitload of money. <laughs> and um, but if it does work, it's going to similar to how he like carved that path for comics to you know put out their their show on youtube etc this is going to start changing the paradigm with these big streamers that think they have you by the balls and start want you to like cookie cutter your shit in order so they could appease corporate clients and marketers this is going to take that power away from them and give certain comics the right to say you know no notes on my shit and that's exactly what he did within the first week he made three times the amount of money back so he made his money back times three within a week i was super happy with the special i know the rest of the asshole army was as well you know true to podcast form i would say he also offered it for free to anybody who would you know dm or hit him up and say they couldn't afford the 15 bucks that he charged for the special and that's why Andrew Schultz is this episode's installment of goats doing goat shit. Hats off to Andrew Schultz and the infamous comedy special. <laughs> Stranger Things Season 4. It's a Netflix original series created by the Duffer Brothers. First and foremost, let's give a shout out to the writers because if we don't do so here on the sponsor day podcast who will shout out to matt duffer ross duffer paul dichter kate treffrey jesse nixon lopez caitlin schneiderhan justin doble curtis Gwynn, jessica mecklenburg allison tatlock and william bridges shout out to all the writers Now, this latest season, we had to wait a minute for. Season three came out in 2019. That means we've been waiting three years for this one to come out. And it definitely didn't disappoint. It was a good season, really good season. And it's the penultimate season. Season five is gonna be the series finale. But for those of you who don't know, let me give you the official synopsis of the show. When a young boy vanishes, a small town uncovers a mystery involving secret experiments, terrifying supernatural forces, and one strange little girl. Then specific to season four is darkness returns to Hawkins just in time for spring break, igniting fresh terror, disturbing memories, and an ominous new threat. And one of the interesting things of, you know, a show taking so long to come back in between seasons is that the cat, especially if it's a, cast of like young actors that the kids grow up you know they were in like elementary or like middle school now they're like high school looking you know they're obviously older like the actual actors i think they're like 18 19 20 some of them but they're all playing like young high school kids or like younger you know like freshman sophomore high school kids but it's definitely a big gap in between seasons you know like they all hit like growth spurts and it's kind of funny and interesting to see and interesting in the sense that the like the writers have to account for that, right? They have to have continuity between the previous season and the current season, but also make the content age appropriate for, you know, to reflect how they look now and like the stage in life that they're in now. So being three years since season three aired, there'd been a ton that I forgot about, including like Hopper apparently dying. Hopper is the character played by David Harbour. He plays like the town sheriff that becomes the guardian of Eleven, played by Millie Bobby Brown. And at the end of season three, there was like this huge big explosion thing with Elle defeating like the monster from the Upside Down. Hopper just disappeared, you know, became dust, but he was actually somehow transported to the other side of the world and like Russia or some shit. Not or some shit. He was in Russia. <laughs> Which we find out here in season four. 
And then the kids were kind of like split up. L then was taken into custody by Joyce, played by Winona Ryder, which is the mother of two of the main characters, which are brothers, Will and Jonathan Byers. Will played by Noah Schnapp and Jonathan played by Charlie Heaton. And they relocated, they left Hawkins and all the other kids were still in Hawkins. So that's like setting the stage for season four. Elle also lost her powers, which is like a whole other story arc that we go through this season with her having to entrust the same people that her, you know, like quote unquote Papa and like the people that were experimenting on her and all the other kids that have powers and shit um, in order to like regain her powers to fight this like new um, ominous force that started to show up. So we see pretty much where like all the kids and, you know, like the main characters are now and, you know, dealing with their like high school drama type of things and like trying to fit in and becoming popular and, you know, into different cliques, dealing with relationships and that kind of stuff. But then this really powerful force, this creature, the villain for the season named Vecna from the Upside Down is becoming more powerful and prevalent and starting to kill people. And in him doing so, we start to get introduced to different characters, like a character that, that I like this season called Eddie Munson, played by Joseph Quinn, who plays like this uh, older kid that Dustin Henderson, played by Gain Matarazzo, uh, that he looks up to. And, you know, he's he's like an older kid, but he's into like Dungeons and Dragons and stuff like that, too. It's like a goth kind of clique. But he had a, a pretty cool character this season. And these murders start happening around town in Dungeons and Dragons. Back then, it's like demonized. It's like this cult and satanic like type of thing. And the town starts like turning on this guy. Also, because one of the characters winds up dying at his house. He lives like in a trailer park. And he's like kind of like this outcast already, like him and his family. Um, so it was like easy for the town to like peg it on him. But this murder happens and one of the stories throughout the season is you know the group the main character a group of kids trying to prove this guy's innocence while he hides out and has like different you know vigilantes and and stuff from the town gunning for him as well as the actual like cops and authorities looking for him to try to get these murders that continue to happen around town to stop and they still think that it's him meanwhile the crew is starting to figure out that it's, you know, a force from the upside down and it's not their friend and they're all separate, but have to figure out how to fight this force like their own way. So Elle is dealing with trying to get her powers back. She has like Will and Jonathan, Dustin and Lucas and Claire, played by Caleb McLaughlin, are in the town where like most of the shit is going on. Hoppers and is in Russia and, and gets word somehow to Joyce Winona Ryder's character that he actually is still alive and she's going through this whole journey to like go to Russia and like try to break him out of like a Russian prison that he's in by paying off some guards that say that they they'll be able to help him break out so there's a lot of different storylines going on but like all converging on to the same goal of destroying Vecna and they find out independently that Vecna is like a hive mind and in this Russian prison, they have like those those like monster characters that they were like fighting in the previous seasons that look like dogs with like heads of like Venus flytrap flowers or whatever. So on that end, they're devising a plan to like fight and kill those. Eleven is trying to get her powers back and get into Vecna's head to like fight him while he's trying to take over and kill Max Mayfield, played by Sadie Sink. And then a bunch of the others are actually getting going into the Upside Down to try to get to Vecna's lair and like burn it and kill him. So it's like a multi-pronged approach. And a lot of cool shit happened this season. You know, it kept you engaged, kept you into it, you know, following all these different storylines and seeing how each of them were going to end up and how they were going to converge. Erica Sinclair's character played by... Priya Ferguson is awesome. She's like a badass and like an unapologetic smartass. And like she's like the youngest uh, of the crew and somehow one of the most mature at the same time. It's just really funny. 
when there was a really cool fight scene in the Upside Down with uh, Steve Harrington's character played by Joe Keery and like fighting off the birds, these like flying pterodactyl kind of like bat bird things that were part of like this hive mind. Like the way that scene was shot was was pretty dope. That's definitely something that stood out. Oh, there was a, a scene with Eleven where her papa, quote unquote, which is the scientist guy, uh, Dr. Brenner, played by Matthew Modine, who was like the head of that like Terry scientific testing they were doing on, on these kids to like give them powers or whatever. There was a scene where he gets shot and like taking his dying breaths and he's asking Eleven to say that she understood, you know, why he did what he did or whatever that he never meant bad. He like wanted good things for her, um, but she needs to understand. And it was like the scene where I expected Eleven to like just say, yeah, I understand or whatever, you know, before he dies. But she showed like this dope ruthlessness in not giving him the satisfaction and just saying goodbye, Papa. Him just dying there. That was a pretty cool scene. Uh, what else do I have here? Oh, Vecna as as like a character, as like a bad guy. I definitely liked him more than like the previous bad guys. The previous bad guys were, were I don't know, like kind of ethereal wouldn't be like the right word, but they were, I don't know. I like how I like the personification of Vecna. Aside from his, he has a really cool backstory of how he was number one. You know, 11 is number 11. She's like the 11th kid that was like experimented on or whatever. The number one kid, which supposedly died or disappeared or whatever that we never hear about, is revealed that is this Vecna character. Like he he wasn't dead after all. So he has like that dope backstory. But I just like his like visually the way Vecna looked like the other things like those creatures and like the smoky kind of big, huge spider looking thing. It's kind of like it seemed like so over the top monstery that it, I don't know. It's like it's lost on me. You know what I mean? It's kind of like, yeah, you like so huge and gigantic and like raw. You know, it's kind of like, eh. but Vecna was more. You know, it was like the shape of a person, kind of reminiscent of like Freddy Cougarish a little bit, especially with the clocks and like the dreamy kind of space that he lived in in the Upside Down. And I don't know. I just found it like that much more ominous and like scarier. I guess because he just seemed like a more like a realistic kind of monster, if you will, if that makes any sense. Oh, and there was actually this one line that resonated with me from a scene where Hopper was in prison, in this Russian prison, with the guard that was supposed to help him escape that wound up getting betrayed by his partner. And then he wound up in jail with Hopper. They're like confiding in each other, you know, just speaking about growing up and and kids and having kids and stuff like that. And Hopper has this moment of self-reflection and he says something to the effect of maybe we resent our fathers so we can become something of our own. You know, he's speaking to that rebellious phase that we all go through where usually with around the teenage years where we know it all and we think we know best and better than our parents and elders and other folks around us trying to school us and i thought that was an interesting way to to look at that dynamic in that type of relationship where it kind of acts as that mechanism of kind of like propelling you to become your own person to do your own thing i don't know i just like that line and um it's an interesting perspective but yeah it was definitely a dope season I recommend checking it out hopefully for the fifth and final season it doesn't take you know another three years i highly doubt that it will i'm sure the the pandemic had a lot to do with you know like shooting schedules and like setting things behind but definitely looking forward to see how they wrap up the series it's been really good series popular series for for netflix and i'm sure they'll they'll do it justice and they left it off on a cool cliffhanger with how after Eleven pretty much fucks up Vecna, Will was still somehow able to like feel like the upside down from like when he was in season one, like trapped in there. He lets them know that, you know, he's not dead. He's really hurt, but that Vecna is not dead. And for some reason, and I, I felt this way like for season two, three, uh, less for season four, but 
I always felt like Will was gonna like turn, and I don't mean turn gay, which he apparently is in love with his friend Mike, which is played by Finn Wolfhard. I definitely picked up on that before they made it like really obvious in in one of the scenes. But I thought that he it was gonna there was gonna be like some sort of reveal with him like being bad or or you know like still having monsters in him like take over him or some shit. Like I felt like that was gonna be a thing but it hasn't been and i doubt they would do it for you know like season five especially like to end the series but yeah it's gonna be interesting to see how how like that plays out maybe he's gonna turn out to have like powers or some shit like because of it but i don't know we'll see anyways stranger things season four it was a dope season check it out if you haven't already streaming now on netflix Billions season six. Damn, I can't believe this show is on season six already. I'm pretty sure I've spoken about it in the past here in the podcast, and apologies if I have and if this piece is redundant, but I found this show. It was on my radar because it's like within the finance space, which is, as a lot of you guys know, I work in finance and have for over a decade. A decade. So it's like within my wheelhouse of like interests and I wanted to see it, but like never got around to it. And back during one of my trips to India, which I definitely spoke about here in the podcast, I think I I dedicated like several episodes to to my trips to India, which were business related. I was on this flight that's like, like the first leg of it was like 13 or 14 hours long. And, you know, I'm scrolling through the options of like things to watch. And there's like a ton of movies and TV shows. And I'm like really loving this like setup and like this personal space and like business class. I see that billions is an option to watch. And I'm like, oh shit, what a better time than now. Let me, let me, you know, watch the first episode. No lie, I finished the entire first season on that trip. I saw, I want to say probably like six, maybe seven episodes straight on my way to India. And I finished off the, the season on the way back. Like I probably watched four or five episodes or three or four episodes straight took a nap woke up ate something kept watching and i was just like hooked from from the jump and it's a series that i definitely enjoyed ever since and i recently caught up on season six which i'm gonna share some of my favorite takeaways with you fine folks but first as per usual i want to give a shout out to each and every one of the writers that have contributed to the show starting with brian copelman david levine and Andrew Ross Sorkin. Andrew Ross Sorkin is actually the reason why the show was on my radar because he wrote uh, Too Big to Fail, a book that I read about the like 2008 banking crisis and and recession and collapse. And he's a co-creator along with Brian Copelman and I believe David uh, Levine of the show. Moving on to Alice O'Neill, Emily Hornsby, Adam Perlman, Matthew Ross Fennell, Randall Green, Wes Taylor, Jamie Chan, Stephanie Mickis, Leo Sigerson, Willie Real, Wes Jones, Beth Schachter, Eli Addy, Theo Travers, Heidi Schreck, Brian Chamberlain, Lenore Zion, Peter Blake, Young Il Kim, that's a dope name, Michael Russell Gunn, and Ben Mesrick. Shout out to each and every one of the writers and villains that have contributed to the show. And here is the official synopsis for season six. As Mike Prince takes his place on the Axe Capital throne, he's determined to change the game, and new money means no mercy. Meanwhile, Chuck Rhodes is convinced no one should have that much wealth or that much power. With Prince firmly in Chuck's crosshairs, forces will be rallied and scores will be settled. And as all the players seek out new alliances, only one thing's for certain wealth means war and that does a pretty good job of detailing the theme of of the season bobby axelrod which is the played by damian lewis and the main character of the show has a bit of a hiatus this season or at least for most of the season he's involved in the first few episodes the first episode or two then we don't hear from him he's supposedly in hiding and avoiding being being arrested But then this new character, Mike Prince, which we had seen in a previous season or two, played by Corey Stahl, is this 
other billionaire character in the series that has pretty much taken over a business rival of his, which was Bobby Axelrod's character. Chuck Rhodes is the other main character or another main character played by Paul Giamatti, and he's the attorney general of New York. And he's the one mainly driving the theme of highlighting the wealth inequality and gross inequities between the mighty rich and powerful and everyone else. And as usual, in all, as in all other seasons, there's a lot of game theory-esque type of angling going on with all different characters throughout the series, throughout the season, where akin to the like finance game and the legal realm, regulatory realm that overlaps with it, it's really cutthroat and people are trying to get over on each other to increase the likelihood of their success and their success in, you know, whatever it is that they're looking to achieve, usually financial gain, power, etc. But aside from that, there was like a bunch of dope takeaways from this season that I jotted down in no particular order, but just wanted to highlight. First up being Chuck's relationship with his father, Chuck Rhodes Sr., played by Jeffrey Demon. And his father has a, it's like a tough love type of character towards his son. And Chuck is like always seeking his approval and admiration, but never really getting it. And his father believes that he's always like the smartest guy in the room. At least that's how his character is portrayed for the most part. There was a great scene with Bobby Axelrod's character. It's probably like in episode one or two where Chuck is interrogating or like sitting down with uh, Wag's character, Mike Wagner, played by David Costabile. Costabile? Costabile? He's my favorite character, by the way, of the series. A lot of dope characters, actually, in this series. But I like Wags a lot. Um, so there's a scene where Chuck is like interrogating him and like trying to get him to dime out Bobby Axrod. And then Bobby Axrod just like walks in and excuses Wags. And, you know, he interrupts the whole thing. And then there's like this huge back and forth between Chuck and Bobby. And it's just dope dialogue back and forth. It's like a, like a tennis match. It's like dope and witty. And, and something that I love in this show and this is definitely a testament to the writing. There's like so many references, like so much so that it's like a bit on the nose sometimes. It's like every other sentence is like a reference to something. But I love how, like I can't tell you how many times I pause to to like look up what the hell is that reference? Like what are they talking about? There's like so many, and there's like so many that I just like let go, and I'm like I'm not gonna look that one up. But I really like that about the show. It like adds like a a cool layer to the dialogue and it's just like from a writing perspective it's like an interesting tool to use to like help layer your writing and like get certain points across i thought it was hilarious how wags gets i i had forgotten it's been like six seasons there was this character that wags had some sort of issue with in the past which when i saw him i remembered but i forgot what the issue was but wags got revenge on that guy by getting with his daughter and like he went to like meet quote unquote meet the father for the first time but he knew who it was who he was expecting and he just did that to like get back the guy <laughs> but wound up actually like staying with the daughter i thought that was hilarious and what's crazy about the season is that chuck finally got bobby axelrod he got him on actual charges to like lock him up and bobby axelrod wound up selling the company and disappearing selling the company for like pennies on the dollar for a couple billion and disappeared to russia I think it was Russia. So I'm really interested to see how, you know, Mike Prince is the one that like bought up Bobby and like gave him that out by backstabbing Chuck, who he was working with behind the scenes and helped, you know, corner and get Bobby to like make the mistake that he made, the legal uh, regulatory mistakes uh, that he made to actually allow Chuck to finally have enough to like arrest and indict him. Excuse me. And, um, then he fucked Chuck over, like Prince did, because of the financial opportunity of spying Bobby's company, which he did. So it sucks because he finally got him. Chuck did uh, finally got Bobby, but he still got away. And it was a dope, uh, ruthless line that Mike Prince had to Chuck when Chuck was like, yo, you fucking stabbed me in the back. Like we were like we were partners in something, you know, with this mutual goal of getting uh, Bobby Axelrod behind bars. 
And Mike Prince was like, I was never in your ranks, Chuck. I was never in lockstep with you. We just had a similar problem for a while. Then what else happened? Notable here, uh, Dollar Bill and Mafi. Mafi, which is a favorite character of mine because I really like Dan Soda, the comic. And just Mafi's character is, is cool. Uh, they wind up leaving Axe Cap when Mike Prince took over the company. And they, they, they like started out their own uh, little hedge fund. So it sucked because I thought they were going to be off of the show as well. But they were still, you know, they, they were still part of episodes like down the line. And it looks like they're still going to be around. Taylor's character I really like. She's another favorite character of mine. Taylor played by Asia K. Dillon. Um, and I really like how she always says exactly what she means. And she means what she says. Even when she's confused about whatever it is that she's like feeling or thinking. And you see that in a lot of interactions with like her and Wendy. Uh, Wendy Rhodes' character played by Maggie Siff. Speaking of Wendy, um, she had a dope line that I liked when she was speaking with Ben Kim, played by Daniel K. Isaac. And she tells him that sometimes you have to feel two things at once because that's what life demands of us. You know, there was a cool episode that I liked. Um, season six, episode four. Because while watching the show, I'm always like, or part of me is, is noticing and wondering what it is that like the people are wearing or the type of watch they have on. And, you know, it's like uh, all this like fancy shit all over the place. Right. But they have this episode, episode four, where each person that comes on screen when they come on screen for the first time or if they're like wearing something different, they'll say they'll list out the outfit and the cost of everything. And it kind of in this cash is king world of finance that these folks live in, it shows you like this, aside from the fact that I'm like nosy and I'm don't know like what these you know, fancy things are and but am interested in them like, oh, shit, what kind of watch is that? Oh, that's a dope shirt. What kind of shirt is it or suit, etc. Aside from that, it kind of like establishes this pseudo financial hierarchy of things and attaches like unofficial statuses to each of the characters and how they are in comparison to each of their uh, their colleagues so that was definitely an interesting episode that i appreciated and it was everything it wasn't just the like the outfits and accessories that folks had on but like things that were in scenes like there was a scene where michael prince is pitching the mayor of new york um on this stadium idea in manhattan where they can help build to try to lure the 2028 olympic games to come to new york city and instead of like drawn out plans or, or like a powerpoint deck he has oculus rifts oculus rift oculus rift whatever the vr oculus thing <laughs> And he has a couple of those and shows them in VR, shows the mayor in VR, like what the stadium will look like and, you know, try to like immerse them within the experience. And in this episode, it tells you like how much the Oculus Rift costs and like stuff like that. So it was cool. And how much like the whole presentation and like the charcuterie board that was on the table in the conference room that day, like things like that. I don't know. I just found that interesting. There was a line that Wendy told Kate Sacker's character played by condola rashad which resonated with me which was that sometimes staying too long is a bigger risk than leaving too soon and she underscored that by stating that it's never the right time to make a change that's definitely a dope line let me say that again sometimes staying too long is a bigger risk than leaving too soon it's never the right time to make a change that's definitely true and this next note i started writing and then one beating my words in a, a future scene, but I liked that there was this character, Senator Tharp, that wasn't made a pushover like all the rest of the politicians, and that he didn't flip on Chuck and his loyalty to Chuck as fast as like all the other politicians that Michael Prince targeted, which just seemed like comically convenient and like I don't want to say lazy from a writing perspective because it's like not realistic to have you know 30 different episodes of, of dedicated to each 
assembly member that you had to like bribe and convince to like flip their vote or whatever but um just seemed like everyone was like so easily like bought and they pushed over which kind of underscores the whole corrupt politician theme but yeah it's like a little on the nose anyway i like that this one character he was like loyal to chuck no matter what and it kind of like made sense to me it was like everybody can't flip you know what i mean it's like that doesn't doesn't make sense like there has to be some you know even if it's a minority of folks but then have a certain level of integrity where you know they can't be bought or in like the position like this person which is like a much much older politician like i would think someone that felt as strongly as he did about you know his like loyalty towards chuck would have just said you know what fuck it if you want to primary pri- primary me in the next election you know i've been a, a senator for 20 30 years whatever the fuck it is you know i'm ready to retire anyway so fuck it i'm gonna ride with my guy chuck you know what i mean like that's what i expected and i was happy to see that loyalty at first but then he wound up caving and you know giving in to mike prince as well so what a shame <laughs> i did like a line that that same uh politician's character had to mike prince when mike prince was trying to, to like woo him and and he was like dancing around like the subject he cuts him off and he and he says bottom line it for me city boy i like that bottom line it for me like cut the shit just get to the bottom line tell me what it is that you want bottom line it for me i like that and the last thing that i'll say about billy in season six is my guy roger clark was in it from new york one which is so which is really dope and i like uh how a lot of shows especially like new obviously new york based like shows or movies like they'll have like newscasters and stuff like that and i feel like it adds like a layer of realism to it and like authenticity to the show and i realize that it's also something that only new yorkers that specifically watch even even another layer that specifically watched new york one would get and it was just like um like a scene where they were outside and there was some like news cameras and stuff like that and roger clark from new york one was standing there in front of a camera like the scene was just like panning by it so you see roger clark there like amongst a, like a group of people and other journalists and stuff covering something that's going on and you know me as someone that watches new york one i'm like oh shit look roger clark and you know the show does take place in new york obviously and it's just like a, a dope touch i felt and i thought that was uh that was really cool to see and it always it always makes me wonder i wonder how much like those folks who get paid to do those like side gigs and movie roles and and things like that must be cool for them too but yeah that is my little recap and review of billions season six available now on showtime for your viewing pleasure I highly recommend it. Dope show to get into if you haven't already. Billions Season 6. Check it out. And that, folks, was episode 213 of the Spun Today podcast. Thank you very much for listening. I really appreciate it. I hope you guys enjoyed listening as much as I enjoy creating it for you. Please just do me one more favor and stick around for a few more minutes to listen to a couple of ways, a few ways you can help support the Spun Today podcast if you so choose. You choosing to support the show means that I get to create more of the content that I love to create. And I am forever indebted to you for helping to make that possible. I'll check you all out next episode. Peace. What's up, folks? Tony here. I hope you're enjoying this podcast as much as I enjoy producing it for you. Here are a few quick ways you can help support this show. You can support the Spun Today podcast by going to spuntoday.com forward slash support. There you'll find my merch section where you can cop the iconic podcasts versus anybody t-shirt in a wide variety of different colors and all different sizes. Also, if you're into cycling, you can cop the super soft, comfortable, minimalist design Spun Today Bike Club t-shirt. Also available in a bunch of different colors and all different sizes. There are a few other designs of different types of t-shirts. Definitely go there and check it out. SpunToday.com forward slash support. It's the merch section where you can also get a dope coffee mug. I have coffee mugs with the brand new redesigned Spun Today logo on one side 
and the tagline that I end every show with on the other, which is start taking steps in the general direction of your dreams. The mug is available in both black and white because we don't discriminate here at the Spun Today podcast. Again, go to spuntoday.com forward slash support and check out the merch section. You can support the Spun Today podcast by checking out my writing. You can go to spuntoday.com forward slash free writing and check out some of my free association writing, which is intended to be some cathartic free writing, but oftentimes doubles down as motivation for myself and others. At spuntoday.com forward slash short stories, you can read a bunch of the different short stories that I've written and actually listen to the audiobook versions of those short stories there as well. Another way you can help support my writing is by going to spuntoday.com forward slash books and checking out what I have in store for sale. Digital copies are available in all formats, whether it be Kindle, iBooks, or a different type of e-reader. You can also purchase paperback copies if that's your preferred reading method. Currently available, I have my nonfiction, Make Way For You, which is a collection of freely written thoughts that were curated and put together as tips for getting out of your own way. Also available is my debut time travel novel titled Fractal. Again, go to spuntoday.com forward slash books to show your support. Support the Spun Today podcast by following me on social at Spun Today on Twitter, at Spun Today on Instagram. Please also check out and like my Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash Spun Today, and subscribe to my YouTube page as well. On my YouTube page, not only will you get these full length episodes, but you'll also get to check out some chopped up clips and bonus content. To get to my YouTube page, just search Spun Today on YouTube or click on any of the YouTube icons on the footer of my website. Also, don't forget to rate and review this podcast wherever it is that you're listening. It really does help. The Spun Today newsletter is available to each and every one of my listeners absolutely for free. All you have to do is go to spuntoday.com forward slash subscribe and drop in your email address. What I'm going to do is brighten up everybody's least favorite day of the week by delivering five curated things within my weekly newsletter every Monday at noon. You're going to receive a photo of the week, a recommended podcast of the week. I listen to tons of podcasts from an array of varied interests. I cherry pick the very best ones so that you can check them out. I also share a video of the week, which can be anything from a tasty recipe to a dope rap battle to an enlightening TED talk. I also share a quote of the week. And finally, for my fellow wordsmiths out there, a word of the week, so that you can step up your vocab. Again, this curated list is yours absolutely free by going to spuntoday.com forward slash subscribe and dropping in your email address, and you can unsubscribe at any time. Again, go to spuntoday.com forward slash subscribe, drop in your email address, and you'll get the very next one. If you want to help support the Spun Today podcast financially, you can do so by going to spuntoday.com forward slash support. Here you'll find a few different ways that you can do so. You can shop on Amazon, but first go to my website, spuntoday.com forward slash support. Click on the Amazon banner, which will take you to Amazon's website where you do your shopping like you normally do. It will not cost you anything extra, but I will get credit for driving traffic to their website. Another cool way that you can help support this show is through Patreon where you can set up reoccurring donations to my podcast, whether it be $1 per show, $2 per show, etc. And depending on how much you choose to pledge, you will receive some Patreon perks in return. Things like free writing pieces, free bookmarks, free digital copies of my books, etc. Again, my Patreon link can be found at spuntoday.com forward slash support. You can also set up similar reoccurring payments via my Ko-fi page, And if you want to send a one-time happiness bomb donation, if you will, you can do so via my PayPal link. Again, all of which can be found at spuntoday.com forward slash support. If you're a fellow creative, a cool way that you can help support the Spun Today podcast and actually be part of the podcast is by filling out my five-question questionnaire located at spuntoday.com forward slash questionnaire. Here you'll find five open questions related to your craft, your art, what inspires you to create, what type of unrelated hobbies you're into, and what motivates you to get your work done. You can choose to remain anonymous or plug your website and your work. And once you submit your questionnaire, I read your responses on a future episode of the Spun Today podcast. It's completely free at no cost to you. 
And what I like to say about it is that if your responses could potentially spark inspiration in someone else, why not share that? Spuntoday.com forward slash questionnaire. And as always, folks, substitute the mysticism with hard work and start taking steps in the general direction of your dreams. Thanks for listening. I love you, Aiden. I love you, Daddy.